to Just Plain Wrong, the podcast where three Mennonite librarians discuss Amish fiction and depictions of Amish, Mennonites, and other plain groups in pop culture. This is Abby. Before we start this week's episode, we have a few quick notes. First, we are really blown away with how many of you are listening. Thank you so much. I think I can say that all three of us were assuming that only five people would listen to these episodes and that four of them would be relatives. So thank you to everyone for listening, sharing, and chatting with us. Now, here are a few confessional corrections. Yes, I will start. Uh, This is Erin. And in the first episode, our intro episode, I told a story at the end about the Iowa high school basketball tournament. And because of that story, we got our very first corrective note just hours after our episode posted uh, from my dad of all people. So thank you, dad, for listening. And he pointed out that the Iowa State High school basketball tournament is in March, not in November or December. And this is a very minor correction, but I feel compelled to confess the error nonetheless. I'm Tilly, and this week we are discussing the movie For Richer or Poorer. And apparently for a good portion of our original recording, we referred to the movie as For Richer, For Poorer and didn't notice. However, we've decided to keep the variety in titles because the movie was wacky and we're going to give it the respect that it is due by treating it and also the main character uh, with the wrong names. (laughs) But now for our conversation about the movie for richer or poorer. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Just Plain Wrong. I'm Erin. I will be moderating this week's discussion. And with me are my co-hosts, Abby and Tilly. But before we jump into our discussion on the amazing and terrible movie for Richer for Poorer, I'm curious, both of you, uh, what is the most Mennonite thing you did this past week? So Abby, you want to go first? I don't know whether it's the most Mennonite or the least Mennonite. You can decide after I tell the story. First of all, we've been making bread a lot more, but we've been using a bread machine, which would point to least Mennonite. So we were going to make some pizza dough and my husband, Alex, got it ready. He had it dumped all the ingredients in and we were going to have it for supper. And we went and checked and the dough was weird and like almost chalky and just clearly something had gotten messed up. And I was so mad because I have done this so many times. This is so easy. You just dump the ingredients in and press the dough button. It's like the easiest thing. So I was silently judging. And I was just feeling all, now I wasn't expressing it verbally because I was trying to be nice. But anyway, so I was really annoyed because our supper plans went out the window. But the next day I was like, well, I really want to have pizza. So I'll just throw this together. So I threw all the ingredients in, pressed dough, you know, pressed the thing. Came back. I'm like, this looks weird. And I looked at it. I forgot to put yeast. (laughs) I forgot to put yeast in this dough. So I don't know if this is least Mennonite or most Mennonite, but it was a very clear cut example of pride going before a fall. So (laughs) you can decide whether that's a story of the most Mennonite or the least Mennonite thing I've done. I think it's maybe both. Yeah, I think you've really encompassed a lot of the Mennonite experience in that one story. (laughs) Tilly, what's yours? It's been a pretty uneventful week. I did, however take part of a lasagna over to my brother's family for dinner with the I suppose Mennonite subtext of I'm taking care of you in order that you will bring me half of a casserole or something later (laughs) so I'm gonna call that Mennonite yes mine is also baking related and I fear that until COVID allows us to like leave our houses again all of our Mennonite related activities will be cooking themed but yes in an attempt to use up uh the rest of a squash because I didn't want to waste it I pretended it was pumpkin and made some delicious pumpkin cinnamon rolls yesterday I did remember the yeast though Abby (laughs) that does help the other forgot one little um post note to that is that we then didn't want to waste the dough so we rolled it out and made I called my mom and I was like what do I do with bread dough that doesn't have yeast she says well technically that's on lemon bread so I made a bunch of flat bread in the oven think of that, which we're now see that still, right there that's my night. yeah which we are still you know shame eating almost a, almost a full <laughs> week later All right. So on to our discussion. We this week subjected ourselves to the movie For Richer, For Poorer, which I believe came out in the mid 90s. 
1997 Mm -hmm. and was ultimately uh, not a box office hit. And I think after watching it, we know why. So I'll do a 30 second synopsis. Uh, Does one of you want to time me? I can do that. Ready when you are Aaron. Okay, so we have Brad and Caroline, and they are rich and very unhappy and about to get divorced. Uh, But then Brad finds out his accountant has like failed to file taxes. And then the IRS is weirdly very aggressive in this movie and come after them. And so to get away from the IRS, he, uh, Brad, robs a cab and then conveniently runs into his wife and they flee the city and they end up crashing into a pond in Intercourse, Pennsylvania, where there are a lot of Amish people and they pretend to be someone's cousins and they pretend to be Amish. (laughs) (laughs) You got the bulk of it. I feel like everything that happens after they start pretending to be Amish is frankly irrelevant, really. So there is a lot to discuss in this movie because it got many things wrong about Amish. Um, And we'll talk about that later. But I want to start by talking about a few of the things they actually got correct. So Intercourse, Pennsylvania, I think they probably chose it because it's a funny sounding name, but it is indeed a town in Pennsylvania that has a significant Amish population. So anything else? I mean, I think overall they got kind of the, the veneer of the lifestyle you know correct they're hardworking and they mostly farm and they have very traditional gender roles and you know so I feel like a lot of what they got right was kind of the veneer of it which as soon as you kind of look below the surface you're you have issues it was interesting I did watch this with my husband and the part that he got the most upset about was actually the portrayal of the IRS as like this villain with weird abundance of powers so that's not the Amish stuff and it's not something right (laughs) but that was one of the takeaways that I thought was interesting that I probably wouldn't have noticed myself. I would agree I think if you glanced at a trailer or saw two minutes of the movie and got you know the scenery you may not notice anything was wrong but so many of the details just are not working and and the IRS stuff bugged me too it's like I don't think the IRS has an academy pretty sure most of their agents don't have guns and I'm pretty sure they don't have permission to wiretap anyone so I did, I'm, I'm actually surprised to that you didn't mention the Yoder joke at the end as something they got sort of accurate. <laughs> I, I should say that actually is in my notes. The first time we see them walking in Amish country, uh, you see a mailbox that has the word Yoder on it. And Catherine says, that one says Yoder. And he says, they all say Yoder. And that is fairly accurate. <laughs> it's one of the most common names in Amish and Mennonite communities. Mm-hmm. And towards the end of the movie, there's a crowd of Amish folk and IRS agents come in and ask for the Yoders and about half of the gathering stands up. And I did laugh at that. I did that too. That's pretty true. Mm-hmm. Yes. It seems like the authors researched about four facts. One being the town name, one being the name Yoder, and the other being Ordnung. <laughs> so... Let's talk about Ordnung. The writers like really latched onto that phrase, but like never really defined what it meant. They just implied that the cousins who Brad and Caroline were pretending to be were from a quote liberal Ordnung in Missouri and they call their own very conservative, but Again, we can talk about how they got all that wrong later, but I feel like maybe for any of our listeners who don't know what Ordnung is, uh, Tilly, do you want to offer a brief definition? Sure. Ordnung is, it translates into several different ways. It often means either like discipline, order, or just sort of rules. And what it actually refers to is the written and unspoken rules that bind a community together. So it could be what an individual Amish and Mennonite conference adheres on, what what has been ruled and written about dress, behavior, um, what lines can cannot be crossed. Could be ordnung, but it also can be used much more generally to refer to a principle of community order. So saying that you're from an ordnung makes no sense. That's like saying I'm from the rules or I'm from, I don't, I don't even know. 
It just doesn't, <laughs> like, it just doesn't work. You have an Ordnung. You don't, like, you're not from the Ordnung. Precisely. Yeah. I was actually, despite the fact that they didn't 100% get this, I was, this was actually something I was kind of impressed in that they thought to include or at least research because I feel like this is not something that's well known the idea that Amish communities can differ fairly significantly from other Amish communities based on what their ordnung was so I I was kind of impressed with the movie and that they decided to latch onto this and make such a big deal about it even if you know they took it to the extremes but yeah that was a point I was kind of impressed with yeah that's true they at least I mean, this was pre-Google, but someone did a little bit of research to, to come up with that. So let's talk about the plot, which, again, includes a whole lot of non-Amish things. Um, but a central piece of it is that Brad and Caroline, these two New Yorkers who have never farmed in their lives and are very rich and hoity-toity sorts of people, have somehow duped the Amish into believing that they are actually Amish people. And we find out at the end of the movie that they weren't actually duping them, but the premise of the movie is that they they are convincing for most of the movie. So thoughts? Could that actually happen? No. Yeah, I'm going to say with significant more research, yes, potentially. The basic idea that someone wouldn't recognize, at least to some degree, their cousins, cousins. or very quickly just be like, what's your mother's name (laughs) which that was one thing like the Mennonite game would have easily defeated this dupe within the first 30 seconds of conversation because the first thing you would do after meeting a cousin who you haven't seen in years and years and years is you would immediately start exchanging news you would want to know oh how so and so and how so and so and what's you know what's up with them which would immediately (laughs) make it quite clear that these are not your cousins yeah i definitely agree with the idea that in this movie the amish knew from the you know samuel and lavina knew from the minute what was going on i think in some ways if it were to actually happen in real life the reason they would potentially do it would actually maybe be from a almost from an evangelical slash wanting to help reason like they could see that these people were obviously in need and would take them in out of that perspective or also kind of as a yeah, these are people who might need our help or we could help influence in some positive way. Like that I could buy more so than help with strong quotations about them. Yeah, so my big thing with the the duping joke was all Amish speak Pennsylvania Dutch. And it feels like (laughs) if you've ever heard Amish people at the store or like when they talk to each other, they're always talking in Dutch. So beyond the fact he didn't have a beard and and all those other telltale signs just visually, that they didn't speak Pennsylvania Dutch, (laughs) to me, it was just like, come on, like, they would never fall for this. Tilly, I don't know if you have anything more to say on that, or if you just want to jump straight into all the issues with the farming situation. (laughs) The farming, there was some yelling at the TV for that one. In part, there were a lot of things that got wrong, namely... Brad is expected to handle a draft horse named Big John, and he's expected to plow. And they're using moldboard plow, which is still in use today, but probably a single moldboard plow would not be. Farming one row at a time is not to their advantage. So while they still may have to avoid the use of rubber tires or use horses instead of gas-powered engines, it's actually fairly common in most Amish communities and old order Mennonite communities to either take modern machinery and retrofit it to work for horses or to just take machinery from the Industrial Revolution on up that actually has seats and can plow more than one row at a time. And plowing is very hard work and very long work. And that is not something you want an amateur doing. It will cause as much difficulty down the road if you plow incorrectly, which Brad does. He makes some very wonderful zigzags in a field. Later, when the corn grows, they all happen to be straight. (laughs) They are. They're magically straight. So he's figured it out really well. 
apparently. Uh, I also noticed that they're so happy that they're in time for planting season, but they jump from plowing to already having planted corn within what I believe is a one week time span <laughs> because they're, they're talking to their lawyer back in New York about when they can get out of Lancaster County. And he says, you know, call me back in a week, call me back in two weeks. So even at the outset, we're looking at three weeks here. And that is not enough time for the corn to get, a, I don't know, knee high. Maybe in a week you could finish your plowing. We'll have um, to find a picture of what the actual plows would look like, because I'll be honest, I grew up in Iowa and the Amish there did use tractors. They just couldn't have rubber tires. Uh, that would be an ordnung thing, everyone. But like, I don't actually even have a visual of what the plows would look like that they actually use. If you're saying they're like double or triple, like how many rows mm -hmm. they do at a time. Anyway, we'll have to find a picture and add that to our into our Instagram. Yeah. So to, to wrap up the farming section, uh, the reason that Sam and Lavinia Yoder give the Sextons that to say, uh, we, we knew you were English all along, but we didn't tell you because it was planting time and we needed the help. I just 100% do not buy it. That kind of help is more harmful <laughs> in the long run. All right, Abby, pick an egregious thing or two that happened in this movie and tell us how much it bothered you. Well, I think for me, I actually, one of the things that I definitely noticed and was frustrated by was the portrayal of food. So first of all, at the very opening, I think it's literally the first night they're there, uh, Brad and Caroline are sitting down to a meal with the Amish. And in a, le in a shot leading up to it, you see like a plate full of like a turkey and mashed potatoes and what looks like a huge feast. And then what they're served are these large, outrageously sized and abnormally phallic wieners, which they're expected to eat plain and so i felt a little frustrated because i was like while amish cooking might be a little on the bland side amish cooking is mostly delicious and especially if they have all this other food they're not going to get served like these random wieners and it was just i was frustrated that essentially all of the food that was shown in the movie was shown as a joke to be like gross or unappetizing and that felt really that felt a little offensive to me. I, I I feel like I Amish food deserves a better a better rep than that. I interestingly like I obviously watched the same movie, but yes, that you are exactly right. But I had not even like registered that among the many egregious things in this movie. So that's interesting. For me, uh, going back to this concept of ordnung, they kept saying that oh we're a very conservative ordnung a conservative ordnung yet there were so many details that were not at all what you would expect of a conservative ordnung um, including they were wearing buttons the, the worst being when all of a sudden they had like a full Amish band with instruments and if you're not familiar with the Amish they do not use any instruments at all not even in church services so there definitely would not be any sort of band occurring um, and they definitely would not have dancing <laughs> like they were dancing and as uh, I also made my husband watch it and as he pointed out like they actually like knew how to do the dance moves implying that this wasn't the first time that they had had some sort of barn dance. So for me, that was that whole scene, like we were just sort of screaming at the TV, like, no, this this is not anything that would ever happen, ever. <laughs> the, the haircuts were another thing I noticed. I don't know if either of you uh, had thoughts on, on the hair. Um, sure. Uh, I think the women, they maybe managed okay. The men seemed to be out of, I don't know, like, old Bavaria or something you know so like yes uh, one of the the side characters named Henner which is not a name I've ever heard in an Amish or Mennonite context had hair roughly to his shoulders which maybe you would see on a younger boy but I don't think you would ever see on anyone of the character's age particularly not someone of age to get married which is pretty much not his only, character's sole purpose and not only was the hair very long it was all meticulously curled under in a way that was like 
the dream of any girl from the 90s. And I'm like, Heather is clearly spending an abnormal amount of time in the mornings with a curling <laughs> iron perfecting his hair. So I think maybe he's just not ready to get married. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on the uh, the immediate shunning that took place at the end. Um, yes. So as, as a plot note, um, so the IRS finally catches up with our criminals who are living undercover with the Amish and they show up at a wedding, uh, which another thing that was happening is the men and women were all like sitting together. What? But then they... <laughs> They have the good Yoder joke where they ask for the Yoders, but then uh, when the Amish realize what's happening and that these uh, criminals and these liars are in their midst, they all <laughs> slowly turn their backs and perform what I literally wrote in my notes in all caps, like immediate shunning. Yeah, that just, it just doesn't mesh <laughs> with so many of the other plot points or any, you know, factual things about the Amish. Uh, from a plot standpoint, if they're trying to help these people, then that's the time to fess up and say, I knew. And from an Amish care standpoint, you can't shun someone who's not part of your community. So as soon as these people are outed as not Amish, shunning doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Shunning is something you do to provide discipline in your own community after you've tried um, advice and reconciliation, other things. Shunning is the harder line that is drawn and it looks different in different communities. So sometimes shunning means not interacting with your family. Sometimes shunning means loose contact with your family. So it varies and it's not usually an instantaneous thing where you turn your back on people. And it's certainly not something you do to outsiders because outsiders are the people that you're taught to forgive. The Amish have a mentality that is very much not necessarily us versus the world, but us away from the world. And so if someone is outside of your world and they've harmed you, your job is to forgive them and move on, essentially. Uh, so the fact that they thought that this was like a bad penalty just didn't make sense for any reason to me. Yeah, no, thank you. That was a very good explanation. Any other egregious things we need to highlight? I was wondering when you two thought of the quilts. Oh, yes. The, the ones about. that they actually used in in the bedrooms did not strike me as particularly Amish quilts. And this is where I do try to be a little bit more aware of how different groups and subgroups of Amish and Mennonite peoples can really vary. So in one community, you can't wear buttons and the next one you can. And one you can only wear black and navy and the next one you can wear purple. So that's, there is some variance there. But one thing that is fairly common in the most conservative old order types is only the use of solid colored fabrics. So even if you're making a scrap quilt, your quilts are solid colored and they had a lot of pattern fabrics. And then they had this thing where they had to convince a panel of elders that it was okay for women to, to wear clothes and for men to wear clothes that weren't just black and white because it expressed the joy of God's creation with color and also made them flirty and feel confident as if confidence and pride were something that the Amish wanted to engender instead of the opposite. So I, I was wondering what you guys thought of that. Yeah, the fashion show was more than a little shoehorned in there. And I was also a little frustrated now, honestly, again, this might vary somewhat. And I do know that Amish communities would, their elders would probably be majority older men. So that's probably not entirely accurate. But the idea of doing, you know, performing it like this and then having it be a, like a forced decision and all of that was clearly nonsense. And I, I did appreciate with the fashion show that she generally stayed within the remote realm of Amish types of clothing except a number of them were missing their um what do you call the cape part of the dress I think that that's makes what it's called to say the cape box yeah, yeah. The we cape. should yeah maybe explain missing. the fashion show I don't think we actually caught that in the summary 
Okay, good point. So Emma slash Caroline, she like does fashion in her life in New York. So she's she loves color and she gets really enamored with the Amish quilts. And then uh, in this particular Amish community, they only are allowed to wear like black or dark colors. And so Emma, new to the community, takes it upon herself to try and get color allowed. Again, sort of like with the farming, this all seems to happen very quickly when in real life this would take years for a bishop and a panel of elders to to change their minds. Um, But as part of this, she creates and sews along with uh, some of the Amish women clothes for a a fashion show that they do in front of the men, which also seems unlikely to ever occur. And the clothes, uh, as Abby has already pointed out, like they sort of were the right style, but they, the the patterns, like she put like quilt patterns on them, um, which I, I don't see Amish all that much here in Indianapolis, but they certainly are all solid colors. They don't add quilt prints to their clothing. I was, her clothes just throughout the movie, um, like you could pretty much tell looking at her that she was not actually Amish. She always kept a couple buttons <laughs> undone up there near the top. Or pulled yep. in her waist a little, or layered Rachel hair was always peeking out from under her cap. Any other thoughts on the, the fashion show? I guess I don't actually know how Amish ordnung type decisions get made. Uh, it's my assumption that it's usually just the bishop making decisions. Is there a panel of elders? Is that a thing? Yeah, I don't know for sure. I, I could see a group of elders, but yeah, again, like I said, the whole, let's put it this way, the setup of having them all sit, you know, at a table and argue your case in front of them and then have a fashion show to declare the the winner i don't know what was going on there that all was 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 nonsense so are there any other favorite moments uh i know for me the uh the line uh that caroline said as she was sitting by the tree and she puts her hand in some cow poo and she says cow dung or ordnung or was it two mounds i don't remember which character said that but that line was in the movie and uh it was great <laughs> So other favorite quotes yes. or highlights, Abby? <laughs> this was where Brad is trying to shame the horse, Big John, into listening to him. And he uses the phrase, be submissive or be adhesive. And I have to, I have to say, I kind of liked that. That was pretty good. <laughs> but my all-time favorite one was when he, when Brad was on um, put on the spot and was forced to try to come up with a prayer. And of course, had no idea how to do this. So he said the following prayer, which I thought was both highly meaningful and very short which you know makes it a good candidate so if you want to adopt this for your own um, dinner table feel free it goes good food good meat good god let's eat (laughs) amen i like that (laughs) amen oh another one that comes to my mind is when he was trying to explain away his lack of beard and it was (laughs) Do you, his explanation was that there was an outbreak of lice in his former Amish community, so he had to shave off his his Amish beard. But that was a good, yes. quick, well, quick thinking. And the best part about that is then Carolyn responds and ad- makes it takes it to the next level with minute lice, minute li- as in minute <laughs> rice. Yes. <laughs> Tilly, any quotes or highlights we haven't touched on yet? I think you got all the quotes that I. I noticed, I I will say the part that made me laugh the most, um, not because it was trying to be funny, was actually this tender heartfelt moment um, between Samuel Yoder, who's talking to Brad one evening and he's counseling him about what a relationship and a marriage is really like and how love of God can really help. And, uh, you know, it's not a prison, it's a a shared experience. And Brad has this sort of change of heart. Meanwhile, Caroline is getting the similar talk from Lavinia Yoder in the kitchen. And I I just, it struck me so much as this just like spoon fed, you know, audience thing. Like we couldn't already tell that these were terrible socialites uh, with the sins of the city and then we just really need to bring it home for for their sake or for the audience's sake and I'm trying to figure out what kind of trope that is it, it's not like a lot of times in comedies you have like a sassy gay friend or like the wise old black man who's just there to just dispense advice in sort of like a like naive wholesome way and I felt like that's what 
all of the Amish characters were. And I feel like we should, there should be a trope name for that. Yeah, your hardworking Amish friend. I'm not sure. <laughs> but yeah, we'll have to come up with a trope for that. Yeah, pure, pure plain person. You know, like, Ooh, I like that. It's like they're supposed to be naive and simple and, you know, because they have their eighth grade education, they're hardworking, but yet they're supposed to carry this grand wisdom about the, the yeah. world. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that, we're making up the trope right now, but I don't know. I mean, there may just not be enough of that media about Amish people out there to merit a trope name, but there's definitely a tendency in books and movies and other media to refer to plain people in terms that make them look naive and is, you know, so at best they're you know, wholesome and principled, and at worst, they're naive or or neutered. Even, you know, like you're you're expected to believe that a fully grown man, in this case, Henner, knows nothing about sex or marriage, and so he comes to Brad's character to ask for advice about love, because he didn't grow up in a big family. He doesn't know what sex is. He's never been told. You know, like it's just because you have different principles and a different environment doesn't mean you're unaware of the world to the extent that people are usually portrayed as. So it's not to say that Amish can't be taken advantage of because they very much can be as any community without ready access to the internet or uh, support systems, outside support systems can be, but I don't know. I, I find that kind of offensive. All right. So we are near the end. Uh, last question is uh, just sort of thoughts on the overall depiction so Tilly you just touched on this a little bit like it was this sort of yeah a lot of them are naive but yet somehow possess grand wisdom at the same time Matt pointed out that and I would agree that the details were really wrong they got a lot of details wrong but they portrayed the Amish overall as like hardworking, honest happy in their lives and their life choices that married couple was you know doing it every night and and we find out at the end like that they weren't being duped when we thought they were so i mean i guess i would say overall it was mostly positive yet wrong if that makes sense at least that's sort of my my takeaway yeah i would agree in some ways i think they got you know in addition to kind of the veneer i think they did get some a very simple i mean i very much agree with what tilly was saying and that i felt like it was overly good-heartedness but i did appreciate that it was a more positive light so yeah if i had to give it a rating i would give it oh i think i'd actually give it maybe four out no three and a half <laughs> out of five ordnungs <laughs> yes that is our rating scale because ordnungs yes because there were some things that were massively inaccurate but the whole fact that they introduced ordnungs even though they didn't use it correctly all the time i was impressed with and i did like that it was clear that they it's not that the amish were stupid that they were playing along with it that was a really critical part that made me feel better about the overall portrayal i agree if they hadn't had that i would have thought much less than i already do about this movie <laughs> i think my rating at least as far as as plot or it just the skill of the film i stick with what rotten tomatoes says which is a 15 percent or 14 percent that's bad uh, so that would equate to about like one and a half stars or one and a half oh, yeah. nunks, sorry but in terms of accuracy i'd move it up to a two or nuns out of five <laughs> okay. yeah i think my ratings would be about in that range like i i sort of enjoyed watching it, it I, I mean i didn't feel like Kirstie Alley and Tim Allen had a whole lot of chemistry, but they had some good comedic comedic lines and it was an entertaining movie. We didn't have to split it up into chunks. We watched it all in one sitting. So I don't know. Yeah, somewhere in that two to three uh, ordnung rating <laughs> accuracy. I, I yeah, I'd, I'd drop it maybe a little bit lower, lower for that. I guess I'll say the movie ends, we didn't get into the plot here, but the movie ends uh, obviously with the IRS showing up and the immediate shunning and, and then they have to go to court, but they do find the accountant and the accountant ends up going to jail, not Brad and Caroline. So they end up free to go back to their lives and they stay married. And as Tilly mentioned earlier, they do end up 
having, or it's implied that they're pregnant at the end. So, you know, happy ending to the movie. But yeah, that wraps up our discussion of For Richer, For Poorer. If you have any comments about the movie or if you disagree or agree with any of our assessments uh, or if you have questions you want to ask us or you want to share your own thoughts about Amish and plain people, feel free to email us at plainwrongpod at gmail.com or find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at plainwrongpod. So thank you for tuning in and we'll talk to you next week.